Here comes the sun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's not bad, eh? My pronouns are he, him. I study physics. A virus is alive? So week six, origins of life and what is life? Mm -hmm. So Beck, how did week six go for you? It was interesting. I, it's always interesting to, since this week had more experts, uh, see different perspectives uh, and remember that science is a thing talked about by people. Mm. I think I always tend to forget that, but then as I'm going through learning more things, I remember, oh no, this is just something that someone proposed in a paper. Yes. And so it was someone who did that. It's not just like this necessarily a, a fundamental thing. Which so it's is, not textbook yeah. science we're dealing yeah. with here. <laughs> yeah, and what someone said the biggest misconceptions that students have about science is that there's an answer to anything or that anyone yeah. is that was Martin definite. Van Cronendonk at yeah. the end there. Okay. Yes, it's very true. So yes, this is uh, research. I mean, it is a research topic. Are we alone? Mm. Uh, learn anything interesting, surprising? Yeah, I think that there is... Uh, it was um, Nick Hudd, and he actually had a, quite a specific... Um, Origin of DNA hypothesis, and RNA. Yes. Yeah, but the proto-RNA yes. being the sort of the Luca sort of of... Of DNA and RNA, well, the which common ancestor of common RNA. Ancestor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was surprising because I, I couldn't pin him down because most people think that RNA came first, and he mm -hmm. kind of said that, but then he said, well, there was proto RNA. He didn't say proto DNA. He said proto RNA, which then divided mm -hmm. into RNA and DNA. And uh, but I've been told that the biosynthetic pathway that leads to DNA goes through RNA, so I'm a little bit confused mm -hmm. about that point because I've heard two both things. Yeah, that was super interesting. And then also Nick Lane. Um, also very interesting. Mitochondria expert. Yes, he was adamant in trying to not define life and then yes. said, I will say the process that happens, which is a cross-membrane proton yes, 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 yes. Uh, gradient, which yeah. I thought was a great sort of definition to start. Well, that's the, the yeah. definition of metabolism. He's a metabolism mm, kind of guy. Okay. He's not into information yeah. and he's not necessarily... Oh, yes, in, he that. also <laughs> talked a little bit about the, the cells but mm -hmm. he's basically into metabolism. So it, it's one way to think of is life is what? It's a barrier with some metabolism and some information. And those mm -hmm. are the three pieces that uh, often are talked about. And he is definitely on the me metabolism side. And that's where the, the pH gradient or the proton gradient across the membrane is what he thinks is the earliest one. I, I agree with that. And mm -hmm. I think it's really fun. It, it would be really cool to find a, an organism that doesn't have ATP but does have energy produced by a proton gradient. I don't know if mm. such a thing exists. Maybe no one's looked for it. I've never heard of it. Isn't every chemical reaction or every energy sort of a proton transport? No, that's just a, that's not electricity. Well, it's a redox reaction of some kind. Yeah, it's a kind. redox reaction, So, not so, so you're, essentially you have an electron that's falling down into, yeah. a, into a deeper well. Yeah. Uh, so that's where the energy comes from. But that can be done by, and transported around with ATP, or it can be linked to the membrane. With the, as protons come across. What's ATP again? Adenosine triphosphate. Right, okay, and then that makes up, this is my non-biological knowledge. Uh, what does that? This ADP do? gets gets another, AD, adenosine diphosphate, gets mm -hmm. another phosphate, it becomes triphosphate, and then it goes around and says, oh, and then it breaks. <coughs> when ATP breaks into ADP, some energy is released, and that energy can then get distributed to it makes drives all almost every chemical reaction that needs to be driven uphill. Okay. In a life form. That sounds okay. So very important. It's a very it's the <laughs> energy currency. It's like a dollar or something. Okay. It's the energy. But the, the it might be the case that proton gradients preceded that. Mm. Yes. Because oh. ADP is turned into ATP at the proton gradients at the mm. at the membranes at ATP synthase, and so you have. Uh, Protons falling across oh, yeah. the membrane because of the gradient, and that produces the ATP out of ADP. Mm. I did write down ATP synthase. Okay, yeah. Yep. Those are some of the earliest things. I mean, that's that's when the first currency turned into the second currency, I guess. Oh. Cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, well, metabolism is very important for life. Mm. All right, how about, uh, did you unlearn anything? I think I just unlearned that there was any consensus Okay, on anything good, good. again as i should probably in university you come into university to unlearn things that's what i think that's <laughs> what i think and i that's my biggest joy as a professor to to teach people to, to say no what you learned is wrong and here's what mm. the truth is um how about uh, any of the videos you have any favorite video i liked uh i think kathy kathy campbell she was yes, cool yes. 
I thought she was cool. And also uh, Laurie Barge. Yes, yes. Working, you're the astrobiologist at um, yeah, she's JPL. She's no nonsense, Laurie Barge. I liked her. She was cool. <laughs> she was just like, this is what it is, and that's, <laughs> she, that's my position. She knows what she wants. Mm. And Mike Russell was also very interesting. Yes, yes, yeah. he is. He Did, cool. Were you able to click on any of the extended interviews? Of the people? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Just for people who aren't familiar, including me, what was N2 fixing or the term fixing? N2, yeah, N2 fixing. So you're breathing 80% nitrogen right now, mm -hmm. right? So nitrogen. And your body is made, it's got lots of nitrogen in it. Mm -hmm. So the question is, and, but you breathe it in and you breathe it out. You don't, fi you don't get it into your body through breath. Oxygen, you do get it through breath. You breathe it in, you know, oxygen is important. So, but you can't breathe nitrogen in and put it into your body. You have to get nitrogen from, you know, bread and whatever else you eat, the food and stuff. Now, um, but then again, how did that stuff get? How did the nitrogen get into that bread or the wheat or the trees? And the answer to that is nitrogen fixing bacteria. Right. N2, N2 okay. is just molecular nitrogen. So fixing it in onto the... Fixing it, pulling it out of the into, air okay. and pulling, and then creating the molecule that has N in it, ammonia or CN, I don't know, okay. some, something with N in it. That's, that's the nitrogen fixing bacteria. And that had to be there in order for life to have a supply of nitrogen. Ah, okay. Cool. And then also, um, with the whole hock and piss uh, mm -hmm. situation, uh, and it was 80, 98% of About 98%. life. So do you think the other 2%, like the sort of any other rare metals that are in us, uh, do they have, do you think they have a very significant contribution? Yeah, that's an important question, and I don't know the answer to mm -hmm. that. The, uh, the hock and piss is just about raw abundances, but mm -hmm. there are... Lot, like iron, for example, that's mm. something that seems to be important in life all the way back to the or estimates of the origin of life. And so that's essential, but it's a very small thing. Mm. And uh, maybe molybdenum as well, or maybe calcium, or maybe sodium. These are all things that are there in life. I'm, I haven't looked at them carefully enough to know. You know, it's, it's really tough to say it's essential because sometimes what you need to do is say, okay, not, sodium is essential. And then you have to find an environment in which you can take away all sodium, no sodium allowed, mm -hmm. and then see if the life form can, well, I'm just substitute that with uh, you know, something else, magnesium or something. And if it can do that, then sodium is less important. Mm, like but the gene it, knocking off. With yes, the, yes, yeah. it's exactly. So it's like it's elemental knockoff, knockouts instead of uh, gene knockouts. So this whole wet dry cycle and you wet things up, wait, wet things up, you dry them out and then you wet them and you repeat this. You were talking about having much bigger tides and having them much more often. Mm -hmm. Is that a potential way to get that wet, dry yes, cycle? Yes, yes, obviously. Yes. So that wouldn't require a hot spring. That could no, happen on no. a beach. Or a Matter of fact, yeah, that's right. If you happened on a mountain, you wouldn't be affected. Yeah. So, yes, tides only affect the beach, right? <laughs> so would you have that same sort of... I don't want to say, is the hot spring scenario as unique as, it, as we're thinking, but when you say hot springs, would that also... Could some of that extend to your shoreline? Well, you know what, you, that, big, that, that hits on a point that's, I think, very important because as we talked about here, we have the continents and here we have the bottom of the ocean. Mm. Four billion years ago, it was probably like this. Yeah. So you probably, hot springs and hydrothermal vents were probably the same thing. <laughs> oh, so that's a spicy take. Well, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, like in many things, when you have A, is it A or B? Well, it's kind of A and a little bit of B, like Kathy Campbell said. And I suspect yeah. that that'll be the right answer, but what combination of what is still has to be worked out. And the... Uh... Saying that the two groups might be in more agreement than they first thought, that's pretty, that's nice. Yes, that like usually it. happens, by the way. Like it's, it, there's a, a polarization that's usually artificial that then it gets worked out with more data and then says, oh, we're both right, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> well, I can handle the ending. Really interesting was Eric Smith and his origin of individuality. I, I'm not quite sure what to, uh, I'm not quite sure how that applies to my understanding of life, but mm -hmm. it's certainly an interesting topic i yeah i'm still working through that in my head but it was yeah it, very I, glad ca to be I call eric the it. the zen master of the origin of life <laughs> <laughs> i bet you didn't click on the two hours and 20 minute uh, extended I, I did and i didn't finish it i can tell you that <laughs> it was getting light <laughs> but he's well worth listening to i'll tell you he's yeah. he also has the book i'm not sure if i yeah this that book one. right here right the, here so he's the author of, he's the author of this book here that uh, i can recommend and Oh God, Eric Smith just, mm -hmm. it left me staring at the ceiling and wondering mm -hmm. things all night. So uh -huh. that's good, probably good. the best kind of interview. Oh, good. Yes, yes, that sounds good. Okay, Eric will be happy to know that. And he's, <laughs> huh. 
He's a I well, doubt I'm the first. <laughs> he's well valued in the astrobiological community for, but he is an is a hydrothermal vents kind of guy. I don't really? think he's. Uh, I, I haven't talked to him specifically about this, but everything I've read in that book is mostly hydrothermal vents. No, oh, what? When? Hmm. When was the book published? Uh, the two, three years ago. Oh, that's not bad. How about Jochen and me arguing about convergence and deep homology? I really, really like Jochen's description of having a degree of in independence. Uh -huh. It's yeah. not a matter of saying this is independent. Yes, 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 it's yes, just yes. it's more independent yes. than another. Yes, yes, yes. I yes. thought that was a really yes. lovely way to describe it and it incorporates your deep homology mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. neglecting the idea of similar solutions to environmental pressures. So I thought that was really, really cool. I, did you did you follow the important point that if we want to extrapolate about what happens here to what happens there. Yeah. It, we need complete independence of yep. the evolution. Yeah. And do you want to push back on anything that was uh, any expert said or I said? Uh, well, there was one thing that I certainly have an interesting question about. Okay. When you talk about multiple origins, so. Multiple independent origins? I mean, that's what no I mean use the word of, no no you have here. to otherwise multiple doesn't mean anything multiple independent I, origin well I mean if you form the very first cell first cell oh I don't, I don't know about know. that first RNA first something in wait let me push back on that yeah do you think there was a first human I don't know There's... I would say definitely not there was no such thing as a first human huh you say if there's a first human her parent was not a human yeah. And her daughter was. I mean, that sounds silly to me. That's fair enough. So that means there's no first human. All right. I, Similarly, there's no first whatever it is you're going to say. Yeah. I, I was just <laughs> meaning to say uh, if what we think of as, I don't know, say prokaryotes, mm -hmm. or if RNA even, was formed in both uh, deep sea vents and, wait, hydrothermal vents mm -hmm. and hot springs, mm -hmm. how would we... How would you know that? How would you see? Well, that presumably, it's different environments, and they would use different base pair nucleotides. For example, you would, you know, yeah. there's ACGT, and ACGT might be in the hot springs, and then AWPX in the hydrothermal vents, and then then maybe they would compete, and maybe one would lose, and then this would become the the yeah. common ancestor, the LUCA, because you've gotten rid of the things that uh, were alternative biochemistries. Is it? possible that you could incorporate something from one into the other yeah yeah well that's in some sense that's what eukaryotes are they're they're kind of a type of archaea but it has lots and lots of metabolic stuff from bacteria huh and that's the horizontal gene transfer is one way to do that endosymbiosis is another way to do that that's and not having a cell membrane to isolate you is another way to do that okay i'm mm. really sticking my neck out and saying there's no definition and we, anything that you know agreeing with nietzsche says anything that has evolved cannot be defined <laughs> I, very few people agree with that. What do you think? Uh, I like the idea of the sliding spectrum. So you have... Aliveness. Not uh, just dead or alive, but aliveness. More yeah. alive, more alive, more alive. Yeah. I, I like the sound of that. And if you have that sliding spectrum and you have something that goes along with that, so whether that is amount of information you can transfer, whether that is, uh, I don't know, Amount of information. So if you have more information, you think you're more alive. Just thought I'd throw some uh, description well, that, that, in there. Well, it's a very common thought. And for example, oh, the uh, last I mean, week... That a flash think, drive's oh, more alive than I am. Oh, that'd be scary. Well, if you get bigger and bigger USB sticks, are they getting more alive? I don't know. I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. I would say no. But, you know, we have an Australian uh, lungfish. It has something like... Just this last month its full genome was sequenced and it had oh, really? 14 times the amount of base pairs we have 3 billion and it had you know 45 billion or something God. oh no not 45 three times 14 you know 45 or something yeah. so uh it had that it was much much bigger so would you call that more alive because it has more information well what i'm wondering is if you have this spectrum where you have less alive more alive mm -hmm. and then you have something tied to it whether it is information transfer so, whether wait, it is wait, wait, why do you want to make this why do you want to make it a one dimensional scale Ooh, are you not, that's you're a cool not happy idea. with two dimensions three dimensions n dimensions well, i mean we can have a hundred if you like but... well that i would like I, because i don't <laughs> because the one dimensionalization i mean it's i mean it's easiest to think about from yeah. non-alive to alive but then 
<laughs> then you want to keep on going and say, more alive, more alive. So That's in fair. a million years, will our descendants be more alive? Probably, because they'll define life in a different way. And then they'll look back at us and say, oh, you guys weren't completely alive. <laughs> But that's the one dimensionalization. But there's yeah. n dimensions. Life goes in so many different directions that uh, yeah. I wouldn't. Uh, but then, then once you get n dimension, you say, well, yeah. this one has more of this, but less of this, and has more of this, but less than that. And which one's more? Li-? So you've got your n dimensional model of what is well, life. Well, usually, Do you have any favorite dimensions? Well, here? usually the the favorite dimensions of origin of life researchers are membrane isolation, <laughs> oh, not I'd... complete isolation, but you know. Oh, okay. I was so, going to say that seems a bit. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, you could, but this is the isolation concept that uh, you liked with Eric Smith, and that is, you have a, you can have hermetically sealed, and you're uh, dead. Is and isolation you, the same as individuality? Yeah, yeah that's all right. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I so you you encapsulate that. something, but you have to go be able to move in and out, but you have to control the in and out. Okay. So if you're completely sealed, you're dead. If you're completely open, you're open to all things, and so you're not even an individual, you're, right? So yeah. there's a there's that's a one dimensionalization of how much back and forth there is, how open or closed you are. Mm. Then there's the extracting energy out of the environment. How much can you do per unit mass or something? That's the metabolism. And then you have the amount of information which allows all of this to happen from one generation to the next. Are we getting closer to answering the question, are we alone, or are we just de- deconstructing this? I think we're certainly getting further away from some of our potentially not entirely correct assumptions at the beginning. So you think we're doing a good job of unlearning our assumptions? I think that's a much better way to put it. So it seems that the development of life, it's important to have tectonic activity or a moon. Well, I don't know. I'm, um, if, now let's suppose, for the hot spring scenario, actually the hot spring scenario does not rely on the moon's tides for a wet, dry cycles. It relies on evaporation. Rain okay. and then evaporation, mm-hmm. rain and evaporation. The same kind of thing that you get at, uh, at uh, Yellowstone and the tides are not there. Mm-hmm. Uh, tides are, if you're on a, in a tide pool, I mean, Darwin's original proposal was a tide pool mm-hmm. where you would have these tides coming in and out and then dr- wet, dry cycles that way. But notice that maybe the geothermal energy is not as much there. If you had photons as the source, mm-hmm. then a tide pool that wet and dries would be good. But apparently, we, photosynthesis was late, and that seems to indicate that you needed the redox potential chemotrophy yeah. of hydrothermal vents or hot springs. Okay. So that's why the ocean tides are some, maybe not necessary for either one of those. Mm-hmm. Or I'm wrong. I'm <laughs> I think an astrobiologist, most of them would say, oh, yes, you need plate tectonics for life. But, you know, maybe okay. I would say the answer yeah. to that is. And this is very much assuming that the life, fo- life follows the same origin as our own. We, you touched on it briefly, but the, it's it's not it's not entirely out of the question that it could have a completely separate origin based on the same laws of physics. I agree, except that what we're looking for when we ask whether plate tectonics is necessary for life is mm-hmm. something more general than what the basic biochemistry is. It's basically saying, does it need to breathe? How mm-hmm. much does it need to have a breathing mode, not only with the atmosphere but with the nutrients in the in the uh, ground? Mm-hmm. And that's more or less the question. And I'm. And you can look at life today and say, okay, what fraction of life is in intimate contact with exchanging gases with the, with the atmosphere? Mm-hmm. And I would say, well, most of the, we are, certainly. Yeah. But not all life is like that. And, and, uh, and I suspect that not all life is as dependent on plate tectonics as many people imagine it is. Mm-hmm. So did you like the interviews? <laughs> I did. I did like them. Um, the, the way that... The way that the information was packeted, in particular, perhaps was a little bit less, a little bit disjointed compared to what I'm Definitely. used to in, in terms of these courses, which is very much being like spoon-fed information. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that really interested me was the discussions of, of the particular biochemistry of these um, hot springs and, and the, the wet, dry environment mm-hmm. and how they were they were discussing sort of the early lipids and, and what could be considered like early cell barriers mm. and how they would flatten out and and yes. when it's wet yes. and then yes. and, and then per, close back mm-hmm. up when mm-hmm. it's dry yeah um do you think that there's much credence in that being an early cell barrier because it, it seems to me like the the timeline doesn't quite 
Well, no, no, it, it, I mean, people have done work by, let's see, uh, Dave Diemer and, uh, and others have taken meteorites and taken lipids out of meteorites and then seen that, hey, in water they form these micelles, the mm -hmm. single layers and also double layered lipids. And uh, so lipids don't seem to be what's hard. The hard part seems to be evolving transmembrane proteins that can turn that lipid layer into a differentially porous membrane that lets yeah. in the things you want and pushes out the things you don't mm -hmm. want. What about the sort of disconnect between the two, um, the two theories, seem, obviously hydrothermal vents, hot springs, mm. but it, um, I forgot, I've forgotten his name, I feel bad about that, but um, men, the hot springs guy mentioned specifically that you needed periods of wet and dry. Yes. Whereas that would be completely impossible in a high Yeah, that was Martin Van Kronendonk who okay. said that. Yeah. And uh, I'm not quite sure he's right because if you notice carefully, if you pay attention to the wording that Kathy Campbell, who is a collaborator with Martin, mm -hmm. she said that you can get that inside of rock. Okay. And so that would, be, that would enable a hydrothermal vent scenario to have these H2O leaving groups mm -hmm. uh, rather than the naive impression that if you're in water, you can't produce more water. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was, I'm interested in that particular detail. So whether hydro, can you eliminate hydrothermal vents based on just the requirement that water is the leaving group when you're polymerizing these biomolecules? Mm -hmm. And uh, Kathy Campbell seemed to suggest that uh, you couldn't eliminate the hydrothermal vent scenario 